Hello friend, I'm Marcy Farrell from thankfulhomemaker.com and today we're continuing on in our series on the Sermon on the Mount. So the last episode, which obviously you see I've had a little break here and I'm trying, I'm working on catching up, but the last episode um, in the series, we finished our time in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5 and we ended as we work through Matthew chapter 5 verses 10 through 12 and working through being persecuted for righteousness sake. So we talked about how there's a conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world, that the world will be in opposition to those in Christ and those in Christ will be persecuted. There isn't much tolerance in the world for those who profess Christ and live out their lives as Jesus has called us to in the Beatitudes. Again, those who are poor in spirit, mourn over their sin, they're meek, they're hungering and thirsting for righteousness, showing mercy, seeking purity in heart, they're going to be different from the world. And those in the world of Christ, and those in the world that are void of Christ, that are enemies of the cross, may see them as a threat. So we know what the characteristics of those in the kingdom are, but how do we live that out in our day-to-day lives? This is the next part of our time in the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to start with two very common pictures we're all familiar with with every day from everyday life because no matter your location in the world you know what salt and light are so we are to be salt and we are to be light or better to state as the scripture states we are salt and we are light so sinclair ferguson stated what salt and light were to life in first century palestine Christians are to the society in which they live. So today, we're going to take one of these at a time. So we're just going to be working through Matthew 5, 13, which reads, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So you are the salt of the earth. And salt here is the Greek word halas. It's spelled H-A-L-A-S in the Greek. And it's speaking of natural salt, salt which purifies or cleanses, preserves from corruption. It's literal sense, it's a literal sense of seasoning salt is found in Matthew 5.13 and in Mark 9.50 and in Luke 14.34. So, and figuratively, salt appears in conjunction with believers' characters and concerning their speech in Mark 9.50 and Colossians 4.6. You can picture that speech season with salt, right? So, earth, there in our, in our verse, um, Matthew 5.13, is the Greek word gay. It's spelled G-H-A-Y and is used instead of world as a metaphor for the people of the world. So, we're in a decaying world, right? We have a mission in this world as believers, just as the disciples of Jesus did, sitting on the side of that mountain, hearing him preach. We are the salt of the earth. Jesus wasn't just speaking to those in first century Palestine, but those few men, weak and sinful men like we are, they did take the gospel and they spread it throughout the earth. And it continues to spread through the disciples of Christ today. And if you're in Christ, that's you, friend, and that's me. We are the salt of the earth. So what effect does salt have on a decaying world? Those of you who can or preserve foods, you know the effect that salt has in preserving food. Before refrigeration, right, the only way to preserve food was to use salt. I'm sorry, my nose is like so itchy all of a sudden. Of course, it's when I turn the camera on. I'm really sorry about that. So as I stated before refrigeration, the only way to preserve food was to use salt. They either salted it well or they soaked it in a salt solution. One pioneer missionary described it this way. He said, this was absolutely imperative under the high temperatures and hot weather of the region, decay and decomposition of meat was astonishingly rapid. We had no winter weather or cold frosty nights to chill the flesh. Besides this, the swarms of ubiquitous flies soon hovered over the butchered carcasses. The only way to prevent them from ruining the meat was to soak the slabs of meat in a strong solution of salt. And the missionary David Livingston, he died in Africa, and they wanted to bring his body back to be buried at Westminster Abbey in England 
And the only way to do this was to salt his body down before shipping it home. And we really need this understanding of salt as a preservative so we get a good understanding of Jesus' words here because this verse in Matthew 5.13 is coming off the text that we worked through last month on persecution. And Sinclair Ferguson states on it, he says, Like salt, Christians may seem small and insignificant, powerless in a power-mad society, yet they have the ability to influence every segment of it, and to permeate the whole. Salt is cheap, its value is minimal, but salt has unusual properties that far exceed its value. So it is with the members of God's kingdom. I love this. Like salt, there will be times when their true usefulness will become very clear." End quote there. So my friend, the world has been decaying since the fall. We know this. It's not getting better. Things may look good on the outside, but inside it's rotting away. Sin and evil, they're everywhere, and they're inside the heart of man. When society is void of the gospel, it's going to suffer from moral decay. When Jesus tells us that we are the salt of the earth, first, we need to note clearly, he's making a statement of fact, okay? The mood of the verb here is indicative. It is not an imperative or a command. We are the salt of the earth, okay? Keep that in mind as we work through this. And every time you read that verse, you're going to remember that. You're going to say that. This is who we are as God's children and kingdom people. We are salt. And one way we are salt is just by being kingdom people around a lost world, right? I didn't come to faith um, in Christ until later in life. And I know many of you have already heard my testimony. I'm not going through my testimony, but I do remember what it was like to be around people who were believers. I tended to watch my language and comments or my jokes. It seemed my behavior cleaned up a bit just by being around them in their presence. And it wasn't because they were acting self-righteously or outwardly condemning me, but it just seemed inappropriate around them to do and say certain things that I could easily do around my friends who weren't Christians. So what do our lives bring about when we're in the presence of those who don't know Christ? Are we being salt? The hope is our lives are lived out so beautifully to those around us that it brings out the best in others. The hope of being a salty Christian is not just to make people take it up a step in their moral behavior or to just behave when they're around us, but salt also adds flavor and zest to what it touches. And the hope is our lives will add zest to those that we come in contact with. Oliver Wendell Holmes said, I might have entered the ministry if certain clergymen I knew had not acted so much and looked so much like undertakers end quote. Ouch. We don't want to look like undertakers, right? When we came to faith in Christ, that truly was the first time that we became fully alive, right? We were dead in our sin and trespasses, and now we are alive in Christ. And as the Lord revealed our sinfulness and he regenerated our hearts, causing us to be born again, we are now spiritually alive. We are living as we were meant to live in communion and at peace with God. Our lives are not dull and boring, but they're alive. Martin Luther said, and I think about this for us as homemakers and wives and mothers, the Christian shoemaker does his duty, not by putting little crosses on the shoes, but by making good shoes because God is interested in good craftsmanship, end quote. So we too, my friend, we should be the best wives and mothers and friends and homemakers and employees and church family members and neighbors, whatever that may be, really, we should give everything our all and our best. We should be the hardest workers at whatever we do. When people see us, they should know there's something different about us. We do our work as unto the Lord. Salt makes us thirsty. Just as Jesus made people thirsty for God, people like Nicodemus, people like Peter, Mary Magdalene, we too, living as salt in a world that is thirsty for living water, right? Our life should be impacting them for Jesus, pointing them to the one, the only one who can truly quench their thirst. R. Kent Hughes stated, even a little salt makes itself known. When we sit down for dinner, all it takes is one little bite to know whether the food has been salted or not. Just a pinch of salt goes a long way. He said, William Wilberforce, the man who almost single-handedly brought about the slavery emancipation, emancipation, I can't even say it, emancipation, Bill in England was living proof of this. So dwarfed by disease, 
William Wilberforce, he did not appear to be a person who would accomplish anything. However, um, Boswell wrote of him. He said, after listening to one of his speeches, I saw a shrimp mount the table, but as I listened, he grew and grew until the shrimp became a whale. Tiny elfish mishappen he was to salt British society, not only bringing preservation, but also enticement to Christ by his beautiful life. So a little salt will make its presence felt. And R. Ken Hughes is continuing here. He's saying, how beautiful is the life of a salty believer, bringing preservation to a decaying world as a living reproof to sin and enticement to Christ, one who brings spice and flavor to life and one who makes others thirsty for Christ and life in heaven, end quote. There's so William Wilberforce was one of those men. He wasn't anything to look at or anything powerful or, you know, intriguing, but he lived a beautiful life of a salty believer. So one more story I want to tell you here from John MacArthur. I, I love stories. I love examples. They encourage me. So I'm hoping it encourages you as it does me. But John MacArthur, in his sermon on this particular passage, he told the story of Woodrow Wilson being in a barbershop one time. So um, this story is being told by somebody else. So and you'll catch that at the end here. So he said, I was sitting in a barber chair when I became aware that a powerful personality had entered the room. A man had come quietly in upon the same errand as myself to have his hair cut and sat in the chair next to me. Every word the man uttered continues here, Woodrow Wilson, though it was not in the least didactic, you know, it wasn't intending to teach, showed a personal interest in the man who was serving him. And before I got through with what was being done to me, I was aware that I had attended an evangelistic service because Mr. D. L. Moody was in that chair. I purposely lingered in the room after he had left and noted the singular effect that his visit had brought about the barbershop. They talked in undertones. They did not know his name, but they knew that something had elevated their thoughts. And I felt that I left that place as I should have left a place of worship. End quote there. So that was Woodrow Wilson telling the story of when D.L. Moody walked into a barbershop. I think that's a pretty powerful story. So, but for salt to be effective, right? It needs to come out of the salt shaker. There was a book I read many years ago and it popped up in my memory as I was working through this text. It was by um, Rebecca Pippert and it was called All Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the World, Evangelism as a Way of Life. Great title there, right? It was a reminder to me that evangelism, it should just be the natural flow out of our lives as believers. We need to share the gospel with those we come in contact with and with those we care about. We need to come out of that salt shaker, right? We must be rubbed into that decaying world without becoming like the decaying world, but to becoming a preservative to it. As salt in a dead and decaying world, our life should bring about the hope and life and solution to those who are thirsty for living water. We have true hope to share with them, true living hope, Jesus, and Jesus is a living hope. Our speech should be seasoned with salt, as the Apostle Paul tells us in Colossians 4, 6. Let your conversation be always full of grace, Seize them with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. I think about that verse a lot and how often my conversation is not full of grace or seasoned with salt. And I pray that it would be. Um, we get a further explanation of what that should look like in the parallel passage. This is another favorite of mine, Ephesians 4.29. Uh, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Our speech is powerful, ladies, and it can do much harm, but it can do much good, okay? Sinclair Ferguson states on our speech, speech is like salt, too little, and we do not taste the flavor of the food, too much, and we are left with the unpleasant taste of the salt. Like salt, our lives and our speech are to bring out the flavor of Jesus Christ. Too much of ourselves, too much of our talk will likewise leave an unpleasant taste, be like Christ then, lest others are not able to tell the difference between the salt and the meat, between the poverty of our witness and the goodness of the Lord Jesus that they are invited to taste. I think there that verse, taste and see the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. John Stott points out, he says, <clears throat> and when society goes bad, we Christians tend to throw up our hands in pious horror and reproach the non-Christian world. We see this all the time, right? I'm sorry, I'm interrupting his quote there. He says, 
but should we not rather reproach ourselves? One can hardly blame unsalted meat for going bad. It cannot do anything else. The real question to ask is, where is the salt? End quote. So as we continue on in our verse, the second part of that verse says, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So <clears throat> our Kent Hughes from his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, he states here on being desalted. Is there any hope for us if we become desalted? The answer is no, not in ourselves anyway. However, Jesus extends the metaphor into the supernatural. And here we must say that the answer is yes. Jesus is not saying that if a Christian loses his pungency, he cannot get it back, even by going to the source from which it came. Nothing but our own sin can keep us from being resalted. He states, I once met a man who in his 60s was resalted. He told me about how his life had become bland and insipid, and then he was confronted again with the necessity of a vital life for Jesus Christ and committed his life to him. For the next 10 years of his life, he was incredibly salty in the world. The effect of his life is literally known by thousands, so one can be resalted. He didn't give the name of that person, but I was really curious about that, but I couldn't find it anywhere. So George Truitt said on this verse, he says, you're either being corrupted by the world or you are salting it. Ooh, let me state that again. You are either being corrupted by the world or you are salting it. I don't know about you, but I sure would rather be the one salting it than corrupting it. So Jesus's declaration of the state of believers, it leaves us no room for a middle ground here. Sinclair Ferguson said, seasoning society is not a matter of being Scrooge-like personalities whose presence brings us pall of depression and whose entrance marks the exit of joy. On the contrary, the presence of God's people should increase the flavor of life in many different ways. He says, after all, we come to our friends, neighbors, co-workers, or fellow students as those who have been and still are in the presence of Jesus Christ, who has given us an abundant life, right? Think John 10, 10 there. Everything about us should express the attractiveness as well as the holiness of our Lord, end quote there. So let's talk about losing its taste, right? Food without salt, it's bland. It gives flavor and can bring a simple dish to life. I mean, I can't imagine foods like eggs or, um, or, or popcorn without salt. I just, I need salt. My husband is one, I think he puts salt on things before he tastes it. I'm always the taster and then I add the salt. Um, but our lives as Christians are to be what salt is to food. We should give flavor to life. And so often as Christians, we can have the opposite effect. The world may see us as taking the flavor out of life. So even as Constantine made Christianity the religion of the Roman Empire, there came to the throne another emperor called Julian, who wished to put the clock back and to bring back the old gods with little g there. His complaint was, have you looked at these Christians closely? Hollow-eyed, pale-cheeked, flat-breasted all. They brood their lives away, unspurred by ambition. The sun shines for them, but they don't see it. The earth offers them its fullness, but they desire it not. All their desire is to renounce and to suffer that they may come to die, end quote. Robert Louis Stevenson once entered in his diary as if he was recording an extraordinary phenomenon. He said, I have been to church today and am not depressed, end quote. So our lives as believers shouldn't make others feel in our presence like they're at a funeral, right? But they should be exuding joy, even in the midst of our trials and hard circumstances. We should be living lives of giving thanks to the Lord in all things. We forget that we are sojourners and exiles in the world and, as, and that we are citizens of a heavenly kingdom. When we don't live our lives as children of the king, we become desalted, worthless, thrown out, and trampled. A desalted Christian or church is one that's been diluted by the ways of the world. There's no difference between their life and the life of the unbelievers around them. Are we living out the hope that is within us? Are we letting our light shine before others so that they may see our good deeds and give glory to our Father who is in heaven? One commentator put it, if we're not salting the world, the world is making us rot. So in his high priestly prayer, Jesus is praying for us to be Christ-like to a lost world. He's not praying for us to be taken out of the world, but to be holy witnesses to it. Let me read to you um, John 
It's from chapter 17, verses 15 to 19. Um, He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. So how are we to do this? Jesus tells us in John there, in John um, chapter um I'm losing it there. John 17, sorry, I lost the chapter reference. In John 17, 14, he says, so how are we to do, do this? He says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And then he tells us in John 17, 17, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. So Jesus, how are we to do this? Jesus has given us his word. His word is truth and it sanctifies. The word we are working through here is the Sermon on the Mount. And it's the same word he gave the disciples. It began with the Beatitudes. And what does our Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, what does he tell us about this text that I remind us, I feel like every time, this is how the Christian was meant to live. So the word of God makes us salt to a lost world. It keeps us faithful in service to the Lord. And as we open our Bibles, as we open the word and we obey what it says, our lives will radiate the saving power and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Kent Hughes reminds us, we are salt and he wants us to cultivate our saltiness by constantly communion with him and being constantly filled with the spirit. Then he wants us to get out of the salt shaker and into the world, rubbed into the rotting wounds of the world. And he wants us to remember that though we are not much, a little salt goes a long way. And one more thought here as we're closing here from James Montgomery Boyce. He states, and I like this, it's a good reminder to start winding down here with for you to read. If you remember nothing else, just remember this. God uses the small things and the small people. God uses you and me that he might do his work in the world. As a matter of fact, The smaller you can become, the more effective his work in you will be. Do you know what we are to be? We are to be picture frames within which Jesus Christ is to be seen. God is not interested in its being a gold frame or a beautifully carved frame. He's just interested in it being an empty frame because he knows that when you come to him with that, he can put Christ there. And when people look at you, they will see Jesus. As my husband reminds us so often in our Sunday school study, we're working through 1 Peter, that we are to be billboards for Jesus. So I'm closing today here with the words of the Apostle Paul from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. It states, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. I'm going to end there with Jesus truly is enough always, my friends. I'm so thankful for your time today. The full show notes are over at my home on the web, which will be linked under the video here. So it'll have all the links and references and Bible verses and all that good stuff in it. The whole playlist of all my Sermon on the Mount series, like all the videos, I said that wrong. All the videos are linked here on my YouTube channel under a playlist. And as always, I encourage you. I'm so blessed by you all being here and just even taking the time to sit with me and watch this. If you're enjoying the channel, please make sure you subscribe if you've not and give it a thumbs up if you're um, just enjoy the teaching today. That's all I have for you. I'm so grateful for you, my friend, and I will see you here again soon. Have a very blessed week.